This is the GRTV Backgrounder with your host, James Corbett. We all remember the lies that led the U.S. into the Iraq War. I, I don't think we ever said, at least I know I didn't say, that there was a direct connection between September the 11th and, 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 and Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein aids and protects terrorists, including members of al-Qaeda. You have said in the past that it was, quote, pretty well confirmed. No, I never said that. Okay. I, I never think said that, that is... No, it's absolutely not. What I said was, uh, it's been pretty well confirmed that he did go to Prague and he did meet with uh, a senior official of the Iraqi intelligence service. It appears that there were not weapons of mass destruction there. You said you knew where they were. I did not. We know where they are. They're in the area around uh, Tikrit and Baghdad and, and uh, east, west, south and north somewhat. But after years of media indoctrination, it's easy to forget the other lie that helped rally the country around the illegal invasion of Iraq. Uh, there is some indication, and I don't have the conclusions, but some of this anthrax may, and I emphasize may have come, in from, come from Iraq. Oh, is that right? If that may be the case, then that, that's when some tough decisions are going to have to be made, too. When Iraq finally admitted having these weapons in 1995, the quantities were vast. Less than a teaspoon of dry anthrax, a little bit about this amount. This is just about the amount of a teaspoon. Less than a teaspoonful of dry anthrax in an envelope shut down the United States Senate in the fall of 2001. This forced several hundred people to undergo emergency medical treatment and killed two postal workers just from an amount, just about this quantity that was inside of an envelope. Iraq declared 8,500 liters of anthrax, but UNSCOM estimates that Saddam Hussein could have produced 25,000 liters. If concentrated into this dry form, this amount would be enough to fill tens upon tens upon tens of thousands of teaspoons. And Saddam Hussein has not verifiably accounted for even one teaspoonful of this deadly material. Although it is difficult to remember at this point, the anthrax scare of late 2001 was widely seen as a follow-up to the 9-11 attacks and a sign of things to come at the dawn of the so-called War on Terror. Beginning in late September and continuing for several weeks, multiple anthrax lace letters were mailed to various media offices and the offices of two U.S. senators, killing five and injuring 17. It did not take long, however, for the neocons in the Bush administration to start insinuating that the anthrax scare was tied to their two favorite boogeymen, Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden. In his book, The 2001 Anthrax Deception, Dr. Gray McQueen describes this as the double perpetrator hypothesis, an attempt to blame the attacks on both al-Qaeda and Iraq. He writes, What I call the double perpetrator hypothesis held that bin Laden's group sent the anthrax spores through the mail, but that the group had a state sponsor that had supplied the spores, namely Iraq. This hypothesis, insinuated by key government officials and parroted by the press, had the added benefit of explaining how the anthrax spores used in the attack could have been weaponized so efficiently. Well, the young woman who opened Senator Daschle's mail in mid-October um was very frightened because as she opened it, this white stuff came out. It didn't just fall on the floor. It drifted out of the envelope like smoke. And quite quickly, the entire Hart Senate building was contaminated and had to be closed for several months. So everyone said, oh, well, Al-Qaeda can't do that. They can't produce that. So who could have produced that? Well, it had to be a state, obviously. Let's see. What state could it have been? And we didn't have to wait very long to hear, oh, gee, Iraq had an anthrax program. They weaponized anthrax. This is obviously Iraq as the supporter of al-Qaeda. And this fit with a narrative which people had, certain people had been trying to push from very early, namely that this same double perpetrator had also carried out the 9-11 attacks that Iraq was always standing there in the background as the sponsor, the supporter of al-Qaeda. And this was supported through a number of false narratives, including Muhammad Atta in Prague, 
right? Remember that one? That was in circulation for months. Supposedly, the head of the hijackers had met an Iraqi, um, high-level Iraqi, uh, I don't remember, diplomat or intelligence agent, in Prague before 9-11, and they were obviously working together. So I think the finally, the way the story was supposed to go is that both 9-11 and anthrax, we were supposed to believe, had been carried out by this double perpetrator. And that set things up very nicely for two invasions, of course, Afghanistan and Iraq. The story of Iraqi collusion with al-Qaeda sounded credible enough to an American public that had no familiarity with the Muslim world and was still reeling in shock from the attacks of 9-11. The only problem with that story is that it was a complete lie. When key government scientists came out to denounce the claim that the anthrax contained traces of bentonite, a signature of the Iraqi anthrax program, the Bush administration sought to distance itself from any direct connection between Saddam and the attacks. As filmmaker Robbie Martin explains in his documentary, American Anthrax, however, that connection was reinforced to the public by way of a complicit corporate media. There was one particularly influential story from ABC News and Brian Ross. ABC's Brian Ross. Brian. Peter, from three well-placed but separate sources tonight, ABC News has been told that initial tests on the anthrax sent to Senator Dasho have found a telltale chemical additive whose name means a lot to weapons experts. It is called bentonite. Where for days and days on Peter Jennings and other shows, they claim that they were told by many sources inside the government uh, that tests had found the presence of something called bentonite, which is the hallmark, they said, of the Iraqi uh, biological weapons program. A substance which helps keep the tiny anthrax particles floating in the air by preventing them from sticking together. It's possible other countries may be using it too, but it is a trademark of Saddam Hussein's biological weapons program. It turned out that claim was totally false. There never was any bentonite found. It does mean for me that Iraq becomes the prime suspect as the source for the anthrax used in these letters. There was a concerted effort to try and link the anthrax in the public mind uh, to Saddam Hussein and, and to Iraq specifically and Islamic radicalism more generally. Iraq continues to flaunt its hostility toward America and to support terror. The Iraqi regime has plotted to develop anthrax and nerve gas and nuclear weapons for over a decade. And so they were aware from the start that it was almost certainly a domestic source, and yet all kinds of factions within the government and out tried continuously to depict it uh, as something that was likely coming from Iraq. And, and they continued to do that for several years, um, even when it was clearly established that it was almost certainly a domestic source. Martin points to disgraced ex-New York Times journalist and Iraqi WMD pusher Judy Miller as a particularly egregious example of how the media laid the groundwork for the campaign to tie Iraq to the anthrax letters. To me, one of the most extreme examples of this, though, is a reporter named Judith Miller, who I'm sure many people are familiar with, and, and Graham McQueen pointed me in the direction of a lot of bizarre connections um, to her and the anthrax attacks. She released a book on October 2nd called Germs, which uh, spends about one-third of the pages in the book discussing Iraq's biological weapons program and the possibility of an attack here uh, by an entity like al-Qaeda stealing biological weapons from a country like Iraq and using them to attack our population. Bentonite is also mentioned in her book as a characteristic of the Iraqi anthrax. Um, and even weirder, uh, uh, Judith Miller, um, before 9-11, in June of 2001, was a volunteer in a bioweapons uh, terror drill called Operation Dark Winter that was put on in part by former CIA director James Woolsey. Um, and James Woolsey is also one of the main people going out there after 9-11, pushing the idea that Saddam Hussein was behind the anthrax, and, uh, and Richard Pearl was as well. Um, they spoke at an American Enterprise Institute conference where it's right after the, I believe, the Tom Daschle letter, and Richard Pearl is sitting there basically saying, look, you know, this is only a few letters, um, you know, only a little bit of anthrax. What if Saddam Hussein sent out tens of thousands of letters, you know, filled with the amount of anthrax that we know that he has? So they're already trying to, you know, they're pushing very hard for this idea, and actually a guy stands up in the audience and he kind of says, you know, after listening to you talk today, 
I wouldn't surprise me if this is sort of a Reichstag fire event that some right winger here in this country is actually behind. He wasn't referring to like a right wing super patriot, which is how people characterize Bruce Ivins. He was referring to neoconservative policymakers in D.C. that might have actually been behind it. As we now know, of course, the anthrax attacks were a false flag event. By early 2002, it was confirmed that the anthrax had sourced to the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute for Infectious Diseases at Fort Detrick, a key facility within America's own bioweapons program. Soon, suspicion fell on Stephen Hatfill, a person of interest identified by the FBI, who eventually won a $4.6 million lawsuit against the Department of Justice for falsely accusing him of his participation in the attacks and illegally leaking his identity to the press. The blame for the attacks was then pinned on Bruce Ivins, a researcher at Fort Detrick who conveniently died before the FBI could identify him or try him in court. The National Academy of Sciences and the Government Accountability Office have both cast doubt on the FBI's scientific investigation of the attacks, however, and a whistleblower within the FBI's own investigation has revealed that the Bureau is sitting on evidence that would exonerate Ivins. Whoever the perpetrator may have been, even accepting that Ivins was the attacker, it is a fact that the attacks were a false flag, using crudely forged letters to convince the American public that they were written by Al-Qaeda agents. And that false flag was aided by the government officials and corporate media talking heads who were happy to propagate this false story in the lead-up to the war in Iraq. The legacy of that war remains with us today. The Middle East, including Iraq itself, remains in chaos, a direct result of the illegal invasion and occupation of that country. An invasion and occupation that was sold to the public on the back of brazen lies and outright fabrications. The blood of a million dead Iraqis stains the hands of those who lied the public into that war and those who aided and abetted those liars. Meanwhile, the anthrax attacks themselves remain a case study in how a false flag event can be used to whip the public into hysteria and be led into supporting illegal wars of aggression. Anthrax investigation. Anthrax investigation. Anthrax exposure. Anthrax exposure. Anthrax tests. Anthrax tests. With anthrax scares. Anthrax scares. Anthrax spores. Anthrax spores. Anthrax strains. Anthrax strains. Anthrax hoax. Anthrax hoax. For more on this story and other breaking news and current events, please go to globalresearch.ca. For more research and analysis by James Corbett, please go to CorbettReport.com.